This is an interview with Stan Music on July 11, 2008 at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia about his role in the smallpox eradication campaign. The interviewer is Melissa McSweegan. With this interview, we are hoping to cap capture for future generations the memories of participants and their families involved in eradicating smallpox. This is an incredibly important and historic achievement, and we want to hear about your experience. I have some questions to guide you, but please feel free to recount any special stories or anecdotes that you remember about events or people. The legal agreement you signed says that you are donating the oral history to the U.S. federal government, and it will be in the public domain. So for the record, could you please state your full name and that you know you are being recorded? My name is Stanley Music, and I know that I'm being recorded. <laughs> Thank you. To start out with, can you talk a bit about how your education and upbringing led you to work in the health field? Yeah, my father was a, was an immigrant, uh, although he came to this country at a very early age. Uh, he was the oldest of five or six children. Um, and when his father died, he was still um, a teenager, and he had to... Um, quickly abandon any of his hopes at a higher education and uh, start earning a living for his family. Um, as a result of that, he always encouraged both his sons, me and my brother, to become a professional man, whatever that meant to him. But he, he wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer or something professional and not have the financial worries that he had pretty much all of his life. And so then once you did begin working in health, um, how did you get involved with the smallpox campaign? Well, I, I went, um, I got accepted to two medical schools, one of which was in the same city in which I lived, and the other was um, an hour away and would require that I be in residence away from home, which opportunity I jumped at because I had been to college in the same city in which I lived. So I went to the University of Maryland uh, Medical School and um, fell under the influence of um, Professor of Medicine Ted Woodward, who was quite well known in international infectious disease circles. Um, because I um, fit his profile of uh, whatever he was looking for, uh, during my junior year, summer, between third year and fourth year of medical school, he sent me as a research assistant to Pakistan. And I saw an incredible variety of, of infectious diseases, uh, human rabies, smallpox, cholera, um, and a few others that uh, made a deep and lasting impression on me and probably set my values for somebody who wanted to help make a difference uh, in diseases of poverty in tropical areas and uh, generally trying to bring the benefits of 20th century medicine to um, a population that was living in hundreds of years earlier times in effect. So uh, when you first began working with the smallpox campaign, what was your role? Oh, <laughs> we uh, have skipped a, an awful lot of history then. Uh, so I'm, I was very much interested in uh, infectious disease, uh, internal medicine, and actually specialized in infectious disease, but couldn't quite see myself as uh, an academic uh, fighting for grants, et cetera. So I followed a friend of mine, Mike Gregg, down to CDC and paid him a visit where he was uh, part of the EIS program and editing the MMWR and um, got very interested in a career in the public health service in epidemiology. And the following year, I applied to the EIS, <coughs> excuse me, and, and was 
<coughs> accept it. And because of my Pakistan experience, um, when I was an EIS officer, and Pakistan and uh, West Pakistan and East Pakistan had a falling out, and uh, East Pakistan wanted to become an independent country called Bangladesh, I was part of the team that was sent by CDC to uh, work in Bangladesh um, on an attrition survey uh, designed to make sure that the food that was in the country was given on a priority basis to the areas that needed it the most. Uh, that experience, in turn, uh, led me to um, learn Bengali. And that's why Stan Foster was very interested in recruiting me to the Bangladesh program because I had been to the country before and I spoke enough of the language to get around on my own. So that kind of set the stage for uh, my smallpox involvement. I protested mightily when he um, asked me to join because I had just acquired uh, admission and a full federal scholarship to University of London to get a, an MPH equivalent degree. But he agreed that if I gave him two years of smallpox eradication, that he would see to it that I um, continued on in my uh, academic uh, studies uh, before joining CDC permanently as a, as a staff member. And he was good to his word, as was I. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about the working relationships you had with your uh, counterparts on the ground and what, what were the successes and fail failures you had with that? <coughs> well, counterpart was, I think, um, in many ways an exaggeration because they really had no clue as to what was expected and what was going to be done. We ended up actually setting up a whole parallel system of employment. We used Ministry of Health personnel to be sure, but by giving them, um, by basically doubling their salaries and giving them access to motorbikes and Land Rovers and um, other transportation, um, we elevated their status and they became very loyal to us. Um, they became reliable surveillance partners who could go out on a schedule and be in a village market on a given day at a given time and advertise about the uh, smallpox program and get information about whether there was any smallpox, showing pictures of kids with smallpox and asking if they knew of anyone. But we set up a whole parallel system. The, the government of Bangladesh was very good at acquiescing to um, our stated and carefully thought out most of the time needs, but they, they really weren't partners in the delivery of the services. Um, they just stood aside and let us do our things, uh, mostly. Mm -hmm. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced in the work on the ground? Well, the big, one of the biggest challenges was um, getting people to um, do what they were supposed to do. Um, they weren't used to being inspected. They weren't used to being challenged. They weren't used to having somebody count the number of vaccine vials uh, and then three weeks later come back and ask how many people had been vaccinated and then go back and count the vaccine vials and see if things actually jibed. Um, I learned very early that the Bengali intellect is quite well formed. And they know, for example, that um, there are exceptions to every rule. So when I said, you know, if you find a smallpox case, the whole village is quarantined and you vaccinate everyone. Um, but if I then did an inspection when they said everyone had been vaccinated, they would, I would discover a, a guy dying of TB or congestive heart failure or 
something lying off in a corner of a of a hut, and he had been exempted from vaccination. And I said, there are no exemptions. And they said, every rule has exemptions. And I said, okay. Thought about it for a while. <clears throat> and then I said, okay, we are now going to vaccinate everybody with one exception. We will vaccinate no dead persons. And they laughed, but they understood. And then I had no problems. So it was, it was a matter of understanding the culture, understanding their attitudes, and the challenge then of translating uh, my desires into something that they could follow and give me the results that I was looking for. Um, another big challenge was um, these um, seasonal fairs that pulled people in from uh, many, many miles away. Um, they were a source of revenue to the district commissioners who got a piece of the commercial action. But when I found that a particular fair was actually a disseminating source of smallpox because people who were infectious were coming, mingling with people who were still susceptible, who then spread out and returned to their villages, um, I had a big problem. And I had to people who were earning the money threatened me uh, because I was going to report this. Uh, in the end, I went to Dhaka and uh, informed my superiors about it, but basically got no support until DA arrived from Geneva, listened to my tale of woe, and did his uh, little magic with the political heads of, of the health department and WHO. And then uh, we managed to uh, put vaccinators into the fair area and stop the uh, transmission. So there were, there were challenges all the time. Another challenge we had was uh, a lack of petrol in the uh, um, area that, that I was designed to cover. So we had Land Rovers and we had Jeeps and we had motorbikes but we couldn't run them because we didn't have any fuel. <clears throat> and there was no way to get any fuel. But we ended up doing something quite um, inspired, quite illegal, and quite dangerous. We found a train siding um, run by the army with um, cars full of petrol. Um, we ended up one night... Uh, unpinning the connection to the last car, rolling it a couple of miles down the track, and siphoning out all the gasoline and finding ways to store it and returning the, the car in, under the cover of darkness back to the, uh, to the train um, as if nothing had happened, only it was now largely empty instead of being full. But we needed the petrol to make our surveillance rounds and to keep uh, pressure on this disease to stop it from spreading. So yes, there were challenges every day of many, many, many kinds. Tell me a little bit more about life in Bangladesh from a cultural perspective, not so much just about the work, but <coughs> what, what was it like living in Bangladesh? <laughs> uh, it meant when the sun went down, the lights went out. Um, it meant... Um, learning to be patient. It meant learning to enjoy uh, the simple things like a, a home-cooked meal. Um, there were a mixture of Muslims and Hindus and a few Christians and a few non-believers of every variety. There were some people of the old ruling class um, under the days of the Maharaja. Uh, who still lived in crumbling palaces, um, but it was it was a wonderful education. Uh, and at night, there was nothing to do but talk. Um, there was no radio or television or anything, although I did have a little portable shortwave. Um, but the culture was rich. The people were um, wonderfully um, talkative. 
the oral traditions were great, and I I learned a lot about the people and their their culture, their habits, their food, their clothing, um, their rituals, and the way that they accepted life. And although they had, by my standards, a very primitive existence, they actually enjoyed their lives, I thought, to a much greater extent, even with all the poverty and the disease and the premature mortality and the excess morbidity, to a greater extent and with more relish than I could recall from the United States. As you were working with the smallpox campaign, was there a particular point where uh, you knew that smallpox could be eradicated and would be eradicated? <laughs> uh, well, actually, no. I had the belief that it, that it could be. <coughs> because I understood the epidemiology and nothing in my experience had, had given me any reason to believe that my understanding was different than reality. But every day in Bangladesh, 10,000, that was the birth rate, 10,000 new susceptibles would be born. So even if, as in my dreams, we could fly B-52 bombers wingtip to wingtip over the country spraying vaccine so that everybody who took a breath would be vaccinated, the very next day we would have 10,000 new susceptibles. Um, and I knew that just vaccinating, trying to vaccinate and keep a population fully vaccinated wasn't going to work. What we needed was a, an epidemiologically oriented program that Bill Fagey designed. Um, and clearly when we were uh, working efficiently uh, with good surveillance and good follow-up, good containment, good ring vaccination, uh, good quarantine, we stopped the spread cold. And it worked every time. So I knew that once we had it all together, it was going to happen very quickly, and it did. Now that you have 30-some years of perspective on this campaign, is there anything you would have done differently? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think there was, actually. I think it was, it was a treasure of an experience. It shaped, it shaped my life and my career and, and my attitudes, um, my values. Um, I thought that, that smallpox was just the beginning, that we would then march on to measles and all the other vaccine preventable diseases. After all, we had the surveillance organized, we had the trained staff, we had people in place. All we had to do was implement it, but, but that was not going to be. But my generation of <coughs> CDC epidemiologists were always somehow more empowered and more um, aggressively public health oriented than our colleagues who didn't have this experience. What are the most important lessons that you learned from smallpox that you then applied to other areas of your career after the campaign finished? Hmm. Well, to a certain degree, smallpox was about breaking the rules or interpreting the rules with flexibility bordering on um, breaking the rules. Because nobody sitting back at a desk could figure out what was really going on in the field. If you went to the field, you learned about the fairs that were spreading smallpox. You learned about the people not being vaccinated because they had some other illness, and et cetera. So smallpox taught me to break the rules if I was going to be successful, if I was going to be um, carrying out the disease reduction, following through on the results of an investigation. But you can't operate that way in a civilized world in, in modern um, 
European or, or in America. Um, so I had to change the way that Bangladesh had taught me and learn how to be patient, learn how to educate, learn how to involve the public and not be the kind of imperialistic dictator that solved the smallpox problem but was not going to cut the mustard in, in the real world after that. And how did the overall experience impact your life? Well, it made me a public health believer because I had a, a monster success under my belt. They gave me uh, a quarter of Bangladesh, 25 million people then, five districts, um, a suitcase full of money, um, and some vaccine and some bifurcated needles and said, go do it. And I had a driver and we did it. <laughs> it was amazing. And it, it filled me with a desire to have a full public health career and to carry out those initial dreams that I had when I was but a medical student, wanting to bring those people up to the 20th century in terms of their morbidity, mortality, and infant and child mortality uh, experience. Did you continue working in infectious diseases? Well, I continued working in epidemiology, but um, <clears throat> I, I came back to CDC and worked with Lyle Conrad in supervising EIS officers uh, that were assigned to state and local health departments. I kept my hand in international consultation and did a few WHO and USAID uh, consultancies. Um, I, I used, <laughs> I used the, um, the time to um, understand a lot about other countries and eventually was recruited to the Global EIS by Phil Brockman and then when he retired, uh, I was named his successor. And I put uh, programs in Thailand, Indonesia, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Taiwan, Philippines, Peru, Italy, and Australia. And said no to a couple of very big countries, to the disappointment of my boss, because those countries weren't ready. And they weren't going to participate. But that was India and Egypt. Um, which have since changed, and there are now cooperative programs with those countries. But um, I used I used that. That was that helped define me. Can you tell us one um, one of the most memorable moments you have of your time uh, in Bangladesh? Uh, something that happened, an event that happened, something that that you remember or think back on? <laughs> yeah, I think I can. I don't think that there are very many people who know this story. There was a famine in Bangladesh uh, at that time, in, in at least in my area. Um, there was a, they had two or three rice crops a year, depending on how much water there was. Um, and the physical geography of individual areas. And a rice crop had failed. So there was quite a bit of um, frank starvation. And it was, it was getting hard to hire people because um, the wages that we were authorized to pay wouldn't give them enough money to buy the food that they needed. So we weren't really competitive. And then um, the new rice crop, which was not failing, was about to come in. And here they got a living wage, plus they could put handfuls of rice <coughs> in their pants pockets. And they could earn a lot more, in, in essence, take home a lot more than uh, they could working for me. And working for me meant um, being guards 
um, vaccinating around infected villages. Well, I couldn't live with the idea that we could identify villages and then not protect them, uh, not vaccinate in those villages and not break the chain of transmission. And I sat down with um, one of my subordinates, uh, an Egyptian physician, uh, Ali Salah Murad, a wonderful man. And we sat up at night and thought about our dilemma and how we were going to resolve it. We had radioed back to Dhaka and they told us the price that we pay for each guard was fixed. I don't remember how much it was, 15 Dhaka a day or something like that, but we couldn't pay any more and we needed to pay more. And I, I said, look, you're leaving me in an awkward position. I've got infected villages. I can't quarantine them. I can't vaccinate in them. I don't have enough people. Those are the rules. Okay. So Ali and I sat down and decided we were going to invent villages. And we were going to invent outbreaks. And we were going to invent workers. And we did. And we paid them the right wage on paper. And we encumbered then a lot of need for money which we then divided up among the real workers and paid them enough to keep them working for us and not harvesting the rice. So yes, I can tell you that and probably other stories as well about what we had to do to stop smallpox. Wow. That's yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there anything else that you would like to add or any other stories that you think... I think I've probably got myself in enough hot water at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you really want that story? <laughs> no. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and sharing uh, your experience with us. It's Great. always very interesting. So thank you. <laughs> okay.